At the very beginning of the film, when Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin uncover a face in the Ark, the face looks unusually like Optimus Prime's face. It even has the same battle helmet and horns. Optimus Prime continues his strange beheading fetish by ripping out Shockwave's eye, decapitating Megatron, and killing Sentinel with a headshot. Apparently this is possibly because the Transformers can still live if their limbs were cut off, but will die when their heads are cut off and cannot be resurrected with any reviving device. Ratchet, Ironhide, and Sideswipe have a lot more screen time in Dark of the Moon than in Revenge of the Fallen. Ironhide and Sideswipe had one scene of their own in taking down the dreads. Ratchet had a few more lines of dialogue and was seen more often in very short scenes. When the helicopters get attacked by Starscream, one of the pilots say, 6-1 going down. This may be a reference to the Battle of Mogadishu. Because the film at the last minute changed names, Mirage was referred to as Dino, pronounced D-No, while Wheeljack was referred to as K in the film. This is likely because the writers at first decided to name them after Generation 1 characters before deciding to establish them as separate, new characters. As the tradition goes, Optimus Prime has the first and last lines of dialogue before the credits. The Autobots make a strange change in this movie. In the previous two, they had tried to avoid human casualties at all costs. However, in this movie, they, not just Ironhide, are rather careless when it comes to avoiding collateral damage. Bumblebee may have even killed a few humans in the scene when they attack an illegal nuclear arm site, and Dino intentionally slams Hatchet into a passing car. Dino did show little respect for human lives in the Dark of the Moon video game. As the movies have progressed, a trend appeared where the Autobots were depicted as progressively more human and the Decepticons as progressively more alien, monstrous. Dark of the Moon brings this trend full circle. The Autobots now look, sound, and act very human while the Decepticons have separated from any human-like qualities they might have had. Examples of this are that the Decepticons often take on strange body shapes, have multiple or only one eyes, and they often have mandibles or other strange facial features. There is also a noticeable change in some Cybertronians. When Sam grapples Starscream's eye, he thrashes around like many organisms do when in intense pain. A change has been made in this movie concerning the weapons of the Transformers. In the previous two films, all of their weapons formed from their hands, forearms, but in this one, many of the Transformers have actual weapons that they hold and carry on their back. Examples include Megatron's new blaster, Optimus Prime's sword and axe, Ironhide's heavy weapons, and Sentinel Prime's cosmic rust gun. Sentinel Prime is the primary antagonist. Megatron is the secondary antagonist for the most part, but a crucial plot twist has him rescuing Optimus Prime's life and helps him fight Sentinel Prime, with Dylan as the tertiary antagonist. Before Nest starts attacking Shockwave, a Decepticon protoform said, Holy s asterisk asterisk. Before getting shot by gunfire. Sentinel is seen still trying to kill Optimus with his axe even after Megatron shot him three times with his fusion gun. Fortunately for Optimus, Megatron grabbed Sentinel away. Shockwave was supposedly intended to be the main antagonist in the early development as mentioned by Michael Bay in USA Today. However, Shockwave only received partial screen time like every Decepticon and was only a supporting character who played a minor role, despite the comics and games building him up as the big bad. This misinformation was obviously intentional so as to leave viewers utterly surprised to learn of the real main antagonist. Megatron had less screen time than in Revenge of the Fallen and the first movie. Nobody in the film seems to consider him the threat in the movie. Very few people actually mention his name, mostly because he is physically rotting away. There was no scene that Megatron appeared in that lasted longer than two minutes. Decapitation seems to be a favored method of killing by the Autobots. Hatchet, Soundwave, Starscream, Laserbeak and Megatron are all decapitated. However, Sam, who killed Starscream, is not an Autobot, unless they gave him an honorary title of one. Nearly all of the Decepticons are killed off, including Starscream, Soundwave, Barricade and Megatron. 
Also, though Igor's fate is not confirmed in the film, he survived in the novelization and the comic adaptation. With the latter depicting him being in Chicago and wondering what has become of his master. Originally the third film was supposed to be the last installment, until 2014. Megatron gets killed off again, this time by Optimus himself. That seemed to be permanent, but wasn't Optimus kills Megatron by slamming his battle axe into his head, ripping it off along with his spine. However, in both the junior novel and movie adaptation, Megatron offers a sincere truce and Prime accepts it while in the movie it comes across as less than sincere and Optimus refuses it. Megatron then leaves with the remaining Decepticons to Cybertron, which isn't destroyed in the novels. While both Roadbuster and Leadfoot spoke in Scottish and Cockney accents, Topspin didn't speak at all. Laserbeak is shown to be a shapeshifter. He's shown changing into a smaller pink version of Bumblebee, an office printer, a flat screen TV and a desktop computer monitor. The fate of Wheelie and Brains is untold in the film. It is mentioned they survived the crash in the novelization. This was proven true by the following installments. The Wreckers are shown to be more brutal killers than Optimus, Ironhide, Bumblebee, and Sideswipe all combined as shown when they quite literally ripped a Decepticon fighter pilot to pieces alive and played with his body parts. Leadfoot is shown playing and chewing on his head. Mirroring has some of Theodore Galloway's personality traits, as both believe that the Autobots are too dangerous. However, Mirroring eventually becomes more supportive of the Autobots, unlike Galloway, who kept his point of view the same throughout the whole film. In the scene where the missiles are fired, there is apparently a reuse of movie from Revenge of the Fallen as the guy who says, Target acquired, is the same guy in the same way that said it when the destroyer, USS Kit in Revenge of the Fallen, blew up Devastator. Barricade makes his return since his unexplained absence from the last battle in the first movie, which makes him the only Decepticon to appear in both the first and third movies besides Megatron and Starscream. Despite being a confirmed character, Silverbolt never made an appearance. Maybe he is the jet inside the space center, read the errors section in this article. Also R.I.P. James Avery because he was considered the voice actor for Silverbolt. This is the last Transformers film to feature a song by Linkin Park at the start of the end credits. What I've done, for Transformers, New Divide, for Transformers Revenge of the Fallen, and this time, Iridescent. With Age of Extinction using Battle Cry from Imagine Dragons and The Last Knight using Torches from X Ambassadors. For some odd reason in the credits, Wheeljack and Mirage's names are shown in the credits instead of K and Dino. Unlike the previous films, Dark of the Moon showed more than one on screen Autobot death in which the Autobot stayed dead. Optimus and Jetfire die in Revenge of the Fallen, though Optimus is resurrected. While it didn't happen on screen, Loader died during the battle, as Adinger's card about Loader has the red X that marks the dead Transformers.